Hi, and welcome to the Passionistas Project podcast. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington. If you enjoy listening to the show, please consider becoming a patron. Just a small donation of $1 a month can help us keep the project going, and you'll get rewards like buttons, access to premium content, and invites to Passionistas Project events. Today, we're talking to Dinah Trout, co-founder of HealthAid Kombucha, the fastest growing brand in the category. So please welcome to the show, Dinah Trout. Thank you so much. What are you most passionate about? I'm most passionate about being yourself. I think a lot of people expect me to say I'm passionate about kombucha, and I am, but I'm most passionate about people figuring out who they are and just being that. So how does that translate to your business and what you do? It translates in different forms, but in the very beginning, that was my journey of realizing that my best self was actually in starting something from scratch and building it from the ground up. Uh, and that took a lot of confidence and realizing that I could actually do it even though I didn't have the experience or the money, et cetera, et cetera. So then upon realizing a few years in that I was starting to have some success and that I had that all along, I really gained fulfillment from inspiring that in others. So I think I'm really passionate about that. That's something that like reignites me every time. If I can get somebody else to realize that their best version of themselves is everything their dreams are made of. So then in the beginning, that was a huge part of the business. If I hadn't been passionate about that, I don't think I'd be here today. And then today I mentor a lot of people and that's created an interesting community that I think ends up driving sales. So I think it's a really huge impactful thing actually to the business, but it's a little bit intangible because it's hard to say that, that, that there's a direct return on investment there, but uh, that's not why I do it. I think that passion is actually driving the business. Tell us a little bit about how the business started. Six years ago, picture broke, uh, got a credit card, my best friend and my husband, two different people by the way. People were like, that's sweet that you call your husband your best friend too. I'm like, no, no, there's a third person. <laughs> so three of us, um, Vanessa and Justin, and we're living in tiny little apartments. We're living in LA life, you know, but feeling unfulfilled. And we all work for different corporations and uh, in different jobs, but one thing was the same. Um, we were feeling unfulfilled and we, this growing sort of itch, I guess you could call it, some people call it the entrepreneurial itch, but really it was like a voice that would just get louder and louder saying, this is not what you were meant to do. You were meant to do something different, make a, make a mark. It doesn't mean you have to be an entrepreneur, so to speak, but there was something out there for us that we weren't connected to and it was clear. It was becoming clearer and clearer each year. So that's the picture and uh, we got started because so we started an entrepreneur club and we were like, let's invite all of our friends. We'll just sit around the table, drink kombucha and eat sauerkraut and figure out what this next big idea would be. So to give you a little bit of background, my background's in nutrition. I went to graduate school for nutrition. I fell in love with food there, healing with it, um, learning about it, eating it. Um, and I had a different philosophy than most in nutrition school. Whereas it was focused very much on science and metrics, mine was a little bit more a journey of realizing that food has a lot to do with, uh, or the health of food has a lot to do, I think, with how it makes you feel. So the concept of, I believe in the health it takes to be happy, was already formulating back then, and that is a huge premise to our brand today. So I learned that 10 years before I started Health Aid, and I learned how to make kombucha at that point too not just kombucha, everything fermented. I was a person that you would come over and things would be sprouting on my countertop. Um, and I wasn't afraid to serve it to you at dinner. Um, so yeah, learned how to make really good kombucha back then, had no idea it was gonna be my identity. Even in the entrepreneur club, we would sip on it and it was right in front of our noses. Fine, came up with all kinds of ideas in the entrepreneur club. And by the way, we invited all of our friends and you know, only my best friend and husband showed up. So it, the trio was clear from the beginning, which was kind of cool. So yeah, we're like, in this entrepreneur club, we come, with all kinds of, come up with all kinds of ideas, but most ideas couldn't work out because we, were, we didn't have enough money to start them. It would be some great idea for an app or some kind of consumer packaged good that was just gonna cost too much money to get off the ground. And the real story is, Justin came back from his hairdresser one day and he was told he was losing his hair. That's it, he's got one year left, it's his last hurrah, go have fun with it. And he was really you know, upset about this because he's 28 years old and he's thinking, well, we got to protect this asset and uh, you know, what are we going to do about it? So we all felt motivated to research this a little bit. So we start researching what will regrow hair. 
And we find out that in parts of the world, like in Tibet, and actually all over the world, they use the culture, also known as a scoby in kombucha. And it basically is a piece, it's an ingredient in the making of kombucha, but it's also a byproduct. So it's a very unique thing about fermentation. It's sort of like the sourdough culture. You need a piece to make good sourdough bread, but then it makes more of it so you can continue to make it. Anyway, they use this piece of the culture as a mask on the head. And that that's meant to like increase the integrity of the cells or something and create hair growth. Who knows? All I knew is that I knew how to make these scovies because I knew how to make kombucha. And it was cheap to make kombucha because it's just sugar, tea, and water. So we're like, wait a second here, guys. I think we have an idea. So we start making kombucha, a ton of it, not for the liquid, but for the culture. And it's going to eventually go on my guinea pig slash husband's head. And we're going to see if this thing actually works and then sell it. So that was the whole premise of Health Aid. And what ended up happening is we had so much liquid in the house. It was taking over our tiny one-bedroom apartment. 60 cases, 70 cases. I was giving it away to friends. I couldn't give away enough. It was like unlabeled in brown bottles and very similar to the brown bottles you see today. And we never ended up getting to a place where we put the SCOBY on Justin's head because we were first trying to understand his rate of hair loss. And that involved counting his hairs in the drain after he showered. I won't go into that anymore, but just know it wasn't glamorous at the start. And Vanessa had a friend that worked at the Brentwood Farmer's Market or ran it called us and said, I have an opening this weekend and for three straight months this summer, you can sell your hair product. But we of course didn't have our hair product ready. However, we had about 60 cases of unlabeled kombucha. So in that weekend, we came up with the name, we scotch taped the labels on, we hand drew all the flavors. It was a real like sort of pressure cooker model of we're gonna sell kombucha for three months in this farmer's market and make some money and hopefully with that money start this hair loss business. Well. That summer uh, proved different than we expected. It ended up being that there was a clear demand for our kombucha. People loved it. We loved it too. And we loved selling it. And we expanded very quickly into more farmer's markets. And it only took us three months to realize, wait a second, this is, this is it. So that's how Health Aid started. It's not kind of crazy. So we call it From Hair Loss to Health Aid. What do you think sets your kombucha apart from other companies? It starts, I think, with the liquid, what we do to make our kombucha. Overall, we set ourselves on a mission to be the best tasting and highest quality kombucha you can buy. That was always our uh, niche in the market because, of course, when we started, even back in the farmer's market days, we weren't the only kombucha. So we didn't think that we could compete unless we had some kind of major differentiation. And for us, that was, okay, we're going to make it like you make it at home, like super high quality, super craft but figure out a way to make that at scale. I didn't want to have to compromise on any of the values that I really cared a lot about in food in order to make sales. So that was the premise and the vision and sort of the true north of what we did. It was always to be the best tasting and highest quality. So, so much goes into that. Four main things I would say we do are first we ferment in glass. We're 100% glass fermented. So that's where I believe we're the only commercial brewer in the country that does this. This is really important because kombucha develops acids as it ferments, so it's not like most things. Um, so it's not like beer, it's not like wine and that. I mean, it really develops acids to the point that it's almost as acidic as lemon, ju lemon juice. And it's sitting in this vessel for a long period of time. So if you're using stainless steel, at least my experience has been, in stainless steel or plastic, it leaches that vessel over time. And that's gonna end up in your liquid. So if I'm here to be the best tasting and highest quality, it feels like I have to use a vessel that's not gonna leach um, toxins into your system, so that's why we use glass. I'm really proud of that, but that's a huge pain to do, and that's one of the reasons we're more expensive. And unfortunately, it's something the consumer can't see on the shelf, because everybody sells it in glass, but what are they actually fermenting it in? So that's number one. The second is we use super small batches, I believe the smallest in the industry, two and a half gallons. So we've got about 320,000 glass jars. It's like a matrix scene, and they all ferment, and they all ferment like they would in your closet. I always like to say the kombucha knows no different from the closet. She's, she doesn't know she's surrounded by 320,000 others, but um, it's not like some big massive vat where we have to, you know, adulterate the product because we've, we've scaled it so big. So super small batches. The third thing I'd say we do differently is we flavor with the highest quality ingredients we can find. So we cold press most of the juice in house. Um, looks like you guys are drinking ginger lemon. 
that's literally just a shot of ginger juice and a shot of lemon juice raw straight from the produce straight from the farm so any functional benefit or taste that you believe comes from fresh juice i believe there's quite a bit it's in there and then finally we just make real kombucha there's no added anything we basically just raise it and create the environment where it likes to be raised but in a lot of ways we're more like farmers than we are packagers and so we don't engage in any mass manufacturing methods or anything to um, hasten the fermentation it's just real fermented food like you would make at home talk a little bit about your marketing and branding strategy that is also what differentiates us. So the product is the easy one to go to, but there's so much more to a product than just the liquid. I mean, when you see a product at the farmer's market, that's one thing, but when you see it, see it in shelves across the country, sold in 12,000 stores that we are now, and trust me, when I look at companies that are ahead of me, I'm starting to realize, wow, what effort it took to get to that. I mean, it's no small feat to get this product everywhere, and it takes a culture of people that work in unison. So there's the whole company part that makes us different that I'm really proud of. 200 people now work for this company and they all carry this, you know, sword, I guess you could call it, although it's not a war. They carry this badge proudly and like I am I just feel really strongly that this is a very big reason we're successful as the people. But you mentioned marketing and I think marketing is a huge piece of that too. The brand is our sort of visual, like if you can't taste the product, the next thing is you see it. You see it on the shelf. And it's more to it than just the looks of the graphics. It's You're seeing it in the events you attend, you're seeing it on social media, you're seeing the brand in your life, hopefully. Um, and we have to curate that in just the right way, with just the right message. And I think that's a big differentiator for us too. Uh, we like to be leaders, so we try not to look at competitors here. In fact, I don't really look at all at what competitors are doing because I don't want it to distract me from where I think I want to go. So we've always been leaders in the brand perspective and we wanted to create not just a kombucha of choice, but like a beverage of choice. I mean, ultimately, I want to be as strong a brand as Nike or Apple. So we picked an icon that we thought was strong and appealing to the masses. We wanted to be both feminine and masculine. So there's a lot of intention there. Um, and then from a brand perspective, I think we're leading the pack. You know, if you look at our social media, for example, we're very cognizant to speak to new consumers. And we don't believe that kombucha is just for uh, the people that eat five kale chips and run five marathons in a year. You know, we believe it's for the masses. People who just want to do one thing healthy for themselves, they can enjoy a kombucha. It's not like only for the perfect. So that's a really big inspiration to our branding. You'll notice we try to focus on taste and bright colors and one of our taglines this year is kombucha means delicious in English. Playing on the humor behind what the heck is kombucha anyway, you know? We're just going with that word, but nobody really knows what it means. Funny enough, kombu actually stands for seaweed in Japanese. It has nothing to do with seaweed, so they must think it's really crazy. <laughs> because cha means tea, so it's like seaweed tea, which, you know, is sort of not what it is at all. What's your daily routine like? It has shifted a lot in the last six years. For one, I had a kid in there, so that has shifted things. I mean, whereas before it was just myself I had to really worry about, and a little bit my husband, although he's an adult with you know two legs and two arms, so it wasn't too hard to do. A child really does change those things, especially if you have to run the business. So today, fast forward to today, a week is probably a better way to look at what my day-to-day -day is, so to speak, because a day could just be you know me and you talking for a whole day. So I'd say about, 20% of the time now is spent um, in outward facing um, engagements. So either doing press or interviews or podcasts or some kind of um, rep representation of the company from that aspect out. Another 20% of my time might be spent working with my investors or my board members or any of the other stakeholders in the business that aren't employees either in you know conversations about the future or FYI conversations or preparing for board meetings or we're raising more money. It's like this part of the business I never thought I would do. It's a whole different team I work with up there that none of my employees really ever have to engage with, even my other founders. So that's a good 20% of my time. So if you think about it like a week, that's one out of five days. It's not a small amount. The other 20% is probably putting out fires, so not literal fires, but anything urgent. The way I think about business is it is literally nonstop detours. 
you have a plan and then you basically get roadblocks the whole way there. And it's just about pivoting around those roadblocks and getting back on track or on a new track that ultimately gets you to that same ultimate goal, which would be some kind of like, you know, metric target you've set yourself for the year, but it's not the way you thought you'd get there. So what it basically is, is nonstop problem solving. This is probably the piece that's shifted a lot, I think, over the last six years. In the beginning, it was all I did. It was just, okay, I'm going to come up with this product in the farmer's market. And then it's like, no, you're not, right? Thought you were going to do hair loss. No, you're not. So it's just like a big joke from the universe of like, no, you're not. You're not actually going to do that. Plan was made to be broken. And now it's probably only about 20% of what I do because so much of this work is able to be done by my team, which is why... Again, going back to that, like a huge reason that we're here is because of them. So that makes up, I think we're at 60%. And I would say the 20% maybe is scheduled one-on-one meetings. I'm very, very cognizant about the fact that in order to grow this fast, like this year we'll double, last year we tripled, we'll double again probably next year. It's serious growth. Most companies don't grow that fast in three years, let alone one. So I have to be especially cognizant of my culture and my people and ensuring they're engaged and aligned. We have, we're doing this one, two, three tug thing and the tug of war, we have to be in unison. So I am very adamant about ensuring that our team is having one-on-one conversations. Each employee in this company has weekly one-on-ones with their manager, not fly-by meetings, but scheduled, uh, repeated meetings so that you have the opportunity to ensure, yes, we are on the same page. I found by doing things like that, we avoid explosions and miscommunications and misalignment. So about 20% is those kind of 101 more scheduled type of meetings, so not fires. And then the last bit is about strategy. I try to make some space for me to think about the future and where we want to go. That's also a piece that's changed. In the very beginning, I just did not have time for that. And that really burdened me because I knew that was what a CEO was supposed to do. The more time I have to be in that helicopter though, I feel like the better I can run the business. So I hope to continue to free up space to stay there because I really do feel like that's the job of the CEO. That's just at work. I didn't even mention the fact that like, okay, my kid wakes up at 6 a.m. screaming for milk. I've got to work out, you know, don't bother getting my nails done. So that's a piece that doesn't make it. My husband and I need a relationship. I need to take care of myself in order to feel this way. So that all has to fit in pre going to work, post going to work and on the weekends. And that's a real thing that people don't talk enough about, like the importance of all of that to keep this whole thing going. I think that for the first three years, I was able to just push. And I have a lot of energy in me, so I think I was able to push harder than most, but like I was able to live a really unbalanced life for three years and get this thing off the ground. But then my business started to suffer because I was not in a strong place. And it took me a little while to realize that taking care of myself, and I know everybody says this on paper, but it is a real transformation when you start to realize it for the truth. Taking care of yourself is probably the most important thing I do for my business. And for me, that's getting a massage every two weeks, making sure I have enough mommy and Hendrix time, making sure I have enough time as a wife, and working out five days a week, eating right, also just being kind to myself. This isn't the chapter in my life where I'm also going to be the fittest I've ever been. Managing my expectations, I think, is important too. So anyway, a day in the life is sort of like a struggle, but that's why I like to look at a week. In a week, if I feel like I had a good CEO moment, a good mom moment, a good wife moment, a good me moment, it's a good week. Do you ever feel unmotivated and how do you get past that? Oh my gosh, yes. Dark, swampy mess of despair time, yes. And by the way, this is a really important thing to talk about because so many people from the outside see this upward slope. Oh my God, you guys are doing awesome. I see health aid everywhere. And it's like, yeah, we started from the bottom, now we're here. It's like this story that's told of just positivity and nothing but productivity and wins, right? Well, the reality is, and I didn't come up with this term, but it is a very messy middle. It's a roller coaster ride, and it's ups and it's downs. And I actually think the faster you grow, the more aggressive those ups and downs are. It's funny, for a recent YPO meeting I did, I had to do something with it. It's called a lifeline. You basically have to chart out your lousy 
and your best times, like your, when you felt your best and when you felt your lousiest in your career, your personal life, and your family life. And what was really interesting about my career life is like the most recent years, it literally looked like an EKG, you know, or like a smushed up snake. Anyway, it was really apparent to me upon doing that. I'm like, dang, my life is definitely, and, and it, it would be like 10 or 15 things in a year where I felt the lousiest I've ever felt in my life. But then also the best I've ever felt in my life. And I really think that is just true for business and for entrepreneurs. And when you're doing anything great, actually, it doesn't even matter if you're starting a business, you could be on any kind of personal trajectory and, and it would be the same thing. I think it's really important we just accept that, recognize that everybody who's done anything great is going through that kind of stuff. Nobody got to the top without experiencing some great, great downs. And then also wins, right? So I think it is important we first recognize it and talk about it because I think other people going through it could use that perspective, especially when they're in the dumps. It's good to know I was in that dump too. Okay, so how do you get out? Well, first recognizing that it's very normal and that it's just a wave. So that this too shall pass thing is something I tell myself all the time. And I'm like, okay, this is just a tough wave right now that's got this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and I'm here, but just like in the past, it's gonna go up again. And that for some reason helps me out of it a little bit, that perspective, not just from others, talking to others, but also just in my own life looking back. So I think taking some time to reflect on some of your ups and some of your downs in the past can be helpful or talking to others that are ahead of you and having them reflect on those ups and downs in their life. It helps me a lot to get out of it. And maybe it won't get me out of the dumps because I've still got all that stuff I've got to deal with, but it helps me kind of realize it doesn't add anything to it. You know, I'm not like, oh, and I'm also a shitty person, <laughs> which is what you could do sometimes when you're down there. And then another thing I've been really trying to do is not focus. So people ask the question, how are you, right? And that's like, how do you even answer that question? You know, especially if you're in that whirlwind of like ups and downs in your life, you're like, I guess. And so you just answer like, I'm good. <laughs> but like, you know, there's so much to that. But often what we do is if in that moment we're in a dark space, let's say something isn't going right in the business, we'll focus on that. And that'll be our answer to the question. When really the truth is there's a whole context of things in your life. It's not just that one thing, right? And the other things might be going really well or might be, you know, not going badly, but we don't, we don't even focus on those. And so what I've been really trying to do is when people ask that question or like on a weekly basis, I try to understand what is the whole picture for me? Because the ones that are positive often don't get my energy. And I think that's a mistake. You asked, how do you get out of it? Well, one of the tools is once a week, I try to look at all my buckets of myself. I like to call it my personal boardroom, but it is all those things we talked about. The mom role, the you know personal role, the CEO role, the uh, wife role, the sister role, the friend role. I've got all these different bubbles that are important to me. And I kind of assess where they all are. And then, and what I've started to recognize upon doing that is that problems will jump from different buckets to different buckets throughout my life, but rarely is there a problem in each. And I think that's a really important thing to remember too in the times of, you know, despair because you're, it's not all bad. And if you're able to just pull up a little bit and see that, well, actually five of six of your buckets are going pretty well. So you start to recognize that perspective again. And uh, for me, I guess it's all about finding perspective in those times and that, that can help. So those tools, I think reflecting a little bit on the big picture, isn't everything really okay in the grand scheme of things? And then the one last final tool, I think really important in these times, you know, sometimes problems, especially in business, can be so all encompassing, especially if you're the founder, like all the pressure sits on your shoulders. So it can feel like sometimes just like, oh my God, I'm just gonna die and collapse. I mean, even to this day, I feel sometimes like the company could just slip like sand between my fingers. And that might seem crazy to somebody on the outside because we've got such a, you know, substantial foundation now. It still feels like that to me today. So I think the pressure that we feel is real and sometimes it can feel like an intensity and an immensity of problems that you just can't fight, like it almost takes you over. I think a really important tool is to take some time when you're in those moments and say, what is the next 
best thing to do. Like, okay, so this is coming at me, this is coming at me, the impact is this, oh my God, it's huge, ah, you know, world's gonna explode. Like, you gotta just take it down and say, okay, so that is the problem, what is the next thing? You just have to know the next thing to do. You don't have to know the whole staircase of things, just the next thing. And that's a really good tool too when you're feeling overwhelmed. It's a good thing to talk about though. Everybody wants to talk about the positives. There's a whole mess in the middle. What's your secret to a rewarding life? You gotta identify what's important to you. And this is not a to-do list. It's like an I am list. And it's the things that are really important to you. You wanna be this. So if you were to have, like I often, this is what I have my team do a little uh, once a year, my executive team. Think about like your 80th birthday and you know all these people have come and it's a really cool thing to meditate on or to marinate on. And people are giving speeches. What are they saying about you? What do you wanna be remembered by? And what's your legacy? What's the legacy you wanna leave? It's a really important thing to do, I think, because it can help you sort of clear out all the mess and realize well, you, don't, you don't probably wanna be remembered as some like you know, rich bitch, right? You wanna, you wanna be remembered as someone who maybe inspired others and in what way? What did you teach others? Did you wanna be called a really good mother, a really good friend? So first step I think is to identify the things that are important to you and that will differ person to person. It's interesting, like what you really care about is not what others care about and that's really a cool exercise just in and of itself. And then once you identify those buckets, you just have to feed them. You have to feed them all because if you don't feed them all, they will suffer. So day to day, you might not be able to feed all of them. And that's where I think this work-life balance conversation can sometimes get a little bit like idealistic because you're just not gonna be able to do all those things in a day. But that's why I like to take a step back and say, okay, but how about in a week? How about in a month? Are you able to really feed each of these things so none of them suffer? Because what I've learned is that if one of your important buckets suffers, you are definitely going to suffer as a whole so you won't have as rewarding a life. So I think it's just as simple as that, making sure they're all getting fed and they all need some stage time. If you're a creative person and you're not being creative in your life, you're gonna be able to push through for a few months before starting to really be like, why am I so sad? You just need to paint some things, you know? So if you don't take that time to do it, you're just not gonna be all that rewarded. So I think for me, the secret has been knowing what the buckets are, and making sure you're strategically feeding all of them in a month. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington, and you're listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with Dinah Trout. To find a store near you that carries HealthAid kombucha and to learn how to join their online community, visit healthaid.com. Now here's more of our conversation with Dinah. Do you have a mantra that you live by? I guess follow your gut would be a really appropriate one. I know it sounds silly because it's the tagline for our company too, but it is so much more than a tagline to us. Follow your gut started because, well, kombucha is a probiotic and it's good for your gut and we thought that was cute. And remember, we only had a weekend to figure all that out. We had no idea that it would become like our business practice. I mean, this whole journey has been realizing that there is no rule book. There is no one way to do it right. In fact, there's infinite ways to do it right. So the follow your gut mantra has been almost like a confidence building one of realizing, you know what, just do it. Go with what your instinct says. And at the end of the day, it's still gonna cause problems. You just have to solve those and solve those problems. And as long as you start, and you start to realize, wait, I'm pretty good at solving problems. If you're really good at solving problems in general, you're gonna be good at business, because that's all it is. So follow your gut, I would say, is that. But one quote I will just share, when I am in that dark place of feeling like I can't get out, Follow your gut isn't as motivating at that time for me. So I call on a quote, and I'll say this to myself a lot, and it's, the sky was meant to hold all the weather. So that one helps me when I'm in a dark time. It's sort of like the this too shall pass thing. Rain ain't always bad. Sometimes we got a storm. What's been your biggest professional challenge so far, and how did you overcome it? There's a concept that we, as founders, have had to really yeah, it's been a testament, I think, to how this business has been. And it's the concept that you cannot go professionally where you don't first go personally. So for us, it's a, it's, it's, it's a personal, it's the personal journey that has been the challenge. I think that in a lifetime, most people can relate to transformation. You know, you're not the same person you were when you were 20. 
certainly not when you were in your teens, and each decade, perhaps, brings on a new sort of phase of yourself. When you start from something from scratch, or you're building something great, or you're doing something new, like you're really challenging yourself, I feel like you shove a lot of transformations into what would take a decade, but you're doing like 10 a year. So I feel like the last six years of health aid has been like 60 transformations of myself. And sometimes I'm like, can I just be like myself now? I'm ready. Just no more transformations for the rest of the year. I'm fine. This imperfect self. Because it is. It's constantly challenged me to be better at every single aspect of myself. And that can be really tiring. And so I think that's been the biggest challenge is recognizing that there's just like so much baggage we carry that's unnecessary as people. And I think transformations in general are putting those bags down. And I'm just like constantly like, oh shit, there's more baggage here. I gotta keep, I'm just dropping bags off everywhere I go. So that's been a challenge. Building that confidence in myself along the way and uh, being a stronger CEO each day, each week, each month, each year. What's been the most rewarding part of your career? Probably the same thing. I mean, because once you come out of those, those transformations are always tough. They, they're painful in the time, always. You're always feeling alone, despair. You're, you know, you're feeling down and out when you're in that tough time. Same thing when you like work out. Like let's say you want to like build something in your body. Build, you have some goal for your body. It's always painful. You're going to be a little hungry, a little sore. I think that's a real reflection of like everything in life too. When you're out of your comfort zone, aka you're uncomfortable, that's the sweet spot. So then you get out of that and you're suddenly like, wow, I am like so much stronger and more confident. You're always happier when you're more confident. So I think that's been the most rewarding too, is getting through those and being able to look back and be like, wow, I've come so far in the last six years. Is there a moment that you look back on and think that was really courageous and it changed the entire path that I'm on? So much of what we do, I think, is courageous and we don't realize it. Like, I'll kind of realize it years later. I'll be like, yeah, I guess that was a big deal. And that's where sometimes not being experienced in business can be your greatest asset because you're kind of naive to it. And you're just after something and there's nobody in your head telling you you can't get it. But the thing I'm thinking about, I think, is the two and a half gallon glass jars. On the outside, from a business perspective, anybody with a finance background is going to tell you that's dumb. Uh, they're going to be like, so that's the first thing we need to change. And when we first got investment, that certainly was. But it was something we weren't willing to compromise on. The size, perhaps, but the glass, no. Because we didn't want to create a leaching beverage or beverage that contained metal or plastic in it. And so we stuck to that. We were like, no way, Jose, you are not changing these vessels. And we really stuck to it. And like, at the time, I didn't know how courageous it was. And... I guess perhaps some people might have thought that was even an immature decision to make. But fast forward to today, it's a huge part of our marketing and our message. And I think it's a huge reason we taste the way we do and why people continue to buy us. So now it's the smart decision we made. But, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? So yeah, I guess now I can look back and say that was courageous. Is there something you know now that you wish you knew when you started? Yeah, I mean, all that baggage stuff, just like it's, it's like you carried it for no reason. So all of those transformations are just personal ones where you realized you were carrying this thing from childhood for absolutely no reason at all. Some kind of insecurity about something or other. And you let that go and literally you had the keys all along, you know? So yes, I wish I knew that I had everything it took to be the CEO I am today that I did back then. And all that turmoil and negativity I put on myself was not necessary and was not productive for the business. I think the people who win in business, the really, really, really successful business people are the ones that can get back on the horse the quickest when they fall. It's not that they fall the least. They might actually fall the most, but it's that they can get right back on and they don't second guess themselves and go into that, you know, cycle of self-doubt and why didn't you know that idiot to yourself, that kind of talk. And so now I'm starting to get better at that and I still probably am already halfway there or something like that, but as I get better at getting on the horse without taking myself down, I sort of look back and I think, uh, all that time you spent, sometimes it would take me two weeks to get over a problem just because I was internally like, you know, punishing myself for having been there in the first place. It kind of reminds me of that quote. I think Maya Angelou said it. I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. What did your parents teach you and your mom especially teach you when you were a girl about what girls could and couldn't do? 
so much about your parents is your own amalgamation of it all. So my parents are together. They have a very strong relationship. I've had that model my whole life. Supported each other. Family was always a primary value for us. But they also have very traditional roles. My mother was, she stayed at home with us four girls. They had four daughters together. My mom, you know, cooked dinner every night. She was always like in charge of the home and the home was always a really beautiful, positive place to be. My dad worked a lot. He was an executive. He worked for a long time. It was like they had very traditional roles. My dad pushed me to be really good in school. Like I was never good enough in school and I was always striving to be better in that because of him and his influence. But then my mom also taught me so much about the more traditionally feminine parts of myself, like communication and understanding emotion and being graceful and presentation and food too, which is a huge part of what I do today. So I think what I took sometimes away from their modeling wasn't necessarily what they wanted me to take like because I was too young to, to realize it and I think that was part of the transformation along the way one of the 60,000 I've done in the last six years I wanted to be as like elegant and beautiful and amazing as my mom was in taking care of the home and the husband and the kids and the family but then I also for my father want I took away I wanted to be a really successful business person and just really smart and intellectually driven. So I like I wanted both of these things. And what I had to recognize is sort of like what we talked about earlier. You can't be all things. You can't be everything. And so I had to really kind of tease out what was it that was important to me, to me. And it may be something new that neither of them really necessarily paramounted. So I kind of had to learn that like I am both masculine and feminine and like I'm just me somewhere in the middle so yeah they taught me so much I mean everything prior to 18 years old I learned from them and their upbringing and I think at the end of the day what I hold with me still is love family and pursuit to personal success and hard work all they they both taught me so much of that and then also like I really love food you know and I'm big into real food and whole food and that all comes from my mom what about now? Do you have professional mentors and what do you admire about them? One person that's coming to mind right now that's pretty impactful in my life is my executive coach. So I talk to her every two weeks. Her name's Barbara Poole. She's awesome sauce. And, uh, you know, she really helps me by just asking the right questions, helping me identify the things that I want to work on. And once you do that, that's the hard part because the easy part is finding the person. Oh, okay. So this person who started this business 10 years ago is probably going to be good at that. I'll give them a call. They usually want to talk. And what about cultural heroines? Were there women specifically in pop culture when you were growing up that you admired? As a kid, I admired people like Paula Abdul and Britney Spears. I mean, isn't that so um, funny? Like definitely admired that. But then I also, as I mentioned, admired business people, people who are really successful in their own right. So I think it wasn't until recently that I've really started to admire people, like all people who have accomplished something, there's always something to admire about them. But yeah, no, growing up, I think like I had the sort of standard, the standard ones. I certainly didn't have like a unique attraction to one individual. I really did have a weird attraction to, not attraction, but a, there was something about Paula Abdul. I mean, I literally dressed like her and put the mole there and like I was Paula Abdul for a year. So that was pretty, probably unique. I don't know. I don't know what that means either, but it was back in her spellbound days. Um, anyway, who knows about that? Ask me in 10 years, I might have a good answer. What do you think is the biggest issue for women in the workplace? In the beverage world, I actually think Though it is mostly male, it's like 95% male, I don't think that's because of any kind of discrimination. I think that people are very inviting here in this industry to women in general, they're supportive. Like, for example, it's one of the realities of being a woman is that often we also have children and some of those responsibilities just weigh more heavily on the female. This just is what it is. So if we don't make a business environment or a work environment that's a little bit flexible to that, it's gonna be a lot harder to see women in those roles. The cool thing about the beverage world is I feel like it's been very flexible to that. I take every other Wednesday off as an example to be with my son. One-on-one, -on -one, it's our special day. 
never got any pushback to that. Like it's not an industry in my experience that has been inaccessible to women. It's been very supportive. That said, it's still 95% men, so that's interesting. And I think what I see a lot is just the confidence for whatever reason. I don't know why, but we're less confident, like women are less confident in general, in general. There's always exceptions than the men. And I think that's like a really important thing to consider. And as I have, I have a son now who's two and my sisters have daughters. And I, I'm, I'm seeing that even as early as two and one, we're responding to them differently. We are. Like even if we try not to be, when, when the girl falls, the amount of outpouring attention she gets are you gonna be okay? You know, whereas when the boy falls, it's just sort of like, oh, brush yourself off. I mean, even stuff like that, I'm noticing even in my family, which uh, I think is not too bad in terms of like the role separation, I'm still noticing that even as early on as that, we're starting to input these things. And perhaps maybe there's even things that are innate and not taught that make women a little bit more emotional. All I can say is that once we get over the confidence issues, I feel like women are fantastic leaders because they are really emotional, they're emotionally connected, which I think is an important thing. I know people say emotion doesn't belong in business. I think it's one of the most important things you can have in a business is your passion and your care and your emotion for it and for the people. You can't be so emotional that it like gets in the way of your business, but just the right amount of emotion is good. Probably better communicators as a result of that emotion. So it's hugely important for business and obviously, you know, smart and all the other necessary ways so I actually feel once you get past that confidence thing it's like such a good place to be but like I was hiring for a CFO recently just as an example and I kept my resumes open for a long time and I think I, I talked to probably like 19 or 20 men and like one woman like and it was just that was the input that was like what was coming to me so I don't know if, if, if it's women aren't looking because they're not think like they're happy where they are. I have no idea what it is, but there's definitely, a, it's unfortunate because I would have loved to put a woman in that role. I mean, ultimately I wanted the best person in the role, but if two were equal, I might, I might have picked the woman because I'm trying to build that, but I just didn't have too many options. Which says something. I think in the end, if we can help women get through these confidence issues and maybe even try to avoid instituting some of them as early as one or two, um, we might be in a better position 20 years from now. I think confidence is the number one thing in the way. What's your proudest career achievement? Definitely this company. I mean, definitely. Um, and, and I think the thing I'm proudest of is the people. The, I mean, it's so cool when you have 200 people working for a company you started in your closet. It's definitely like, I, that does not get old. So proudest achievement is definitely that we've come this far and that we did it, the three of us with the help of these people and the, yeah, the company itself is the thing I'm most proud of. And what advice would you give to a woman who wants to get into this field? I would say if you want to get into it, just do it. Because what's going to happen is if you're going to resist, that resistance is going to grow, you're going to resent it, and then you're going to eventually do it anyway. So you might as well just fast forward, cut the shit, do it, you will figure it out if you want to do it. Don't feel like pressure to do it. And the other thing I want to tell people is it's not glamorous. I know it's very hot right now to be an entrepreneur and a founder of a business and a builder of something. And it is really cool in so many aspects, but it's not glamorous and it's not beautiful. As I mentioned, it's messy. So that would be just, you know, prepare for that. What's your definition of success? To me, that changes. Like when I started Health Aid, what I thought I wanted out of this is now very different. I had something to prove then. And that, I think I fulfilled and now it's something new. So success I think is feeling, feeling good about what you've accomplished. And that feeling good thing can change and that hopefully drives what you then accomplish in the future. But yeah, I think it's just feeling good about what you accomplish. Thanks for listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with Dinah Trout. To find a store near you that carries Health Aid Kombucha and to learn how to join their online community, visit healthaid.com. And be sure to subscribe to the Passionistas Project podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming inspiring guests.